Dr. Wilson is professor of surgery at uh, UT Health uh, in the lovely city of Houston. Dr. Wilson, please take it over. Thanks, Dr. Katz. Um, uh, we'll get started as everyone comes in and makes their, takes their seat. Uh, to, uh, this session is focused on uh, diagnostic and technical challenges. Um, so we're going to start with uh, um, Dr. Joel Richter, uh, who is going to talk about uh, eosinophilic esophagitis, or GERD, and uh, the difficulties in diagnosing those two diseases and differentiating them. Thanks, Joel. Eric, thank you. Uh, I think we're all just very pleased uh, how many individuals we have uh, at this meeting. I remember when we started, uh, I said to Reg, the critical thing is that we've got to have a big meeting. I think we thought big was going to be somewhere between 100 to 200, and look at us now, and it's obviously it's just going to be growing. So this is a title that was given to me, I, and as I said, I don't think it in uh, reality really that difficult any longer, but it's been such a interesting historical journey, particularly as a esophagologist who was literally seeing these cases 40 years ago, so it's not necessarily a new disease. So here's the diagnostic guidelines for uh, EOE that everybody's familiar with. Symptoms related to esophageal dysfunction, particularly dysphagia, food impactions, and also GERD. Greater than 15 eosinophils per high-powered field. Eosinophils limited to the esophagus, so that means Every new patient that you see with EOE, you should take biopsies of the duodenum and the stomach at least one time. And then at least as of the criteria of 2011 was this confusion about this unusual made up disease called PPI responsive EOE and what did it mean. And the demographics of the disease are, everyone's familiar with this, uh, most individuals are uh, younger, less than the age of 50, primarily a disease of men, about third or women, and truly one of the more interesting aspects about this disease is it is predominantly Caucasians. Uh, I have now a collection down at the University of South Florida, about 200 patients with EOE, and I only have two African Americans and a couple of Hispanics, so uh, a very interesting thing to evolve over time. On the other side of the slide, though, is the important information that's you know, about a quarter of these patients can have GERD as a big part of the presentation, and I think that's when in clinical practice this can be a problem. So a history of confusion, eosinophilia and GERD, where did it start? Stu, it was all there in Boston, at Boston Children's Hospital with Harlan Winters, a pediatric gastroenterologist, and Harlan, a very bright man, was doing some studies in the pediatric population, mostly kids, uh, some adolescents and one or two uh, young adults, and he made the interesting observation that in the patients that had a lot of eosinophils, then they also had a lot of reflux disease, though as you can see, it's a little bit of a dichotomous uh, uh, variation. And so therefore he said that intraepithelial eosinophils have a high specificity for acid reflux disease in children, regardless of the clinical presentation that it was a new histologic feature which correlated with prolonged pH monitoring, and that in two children over the age of 16 and other adults, he also saw this in peptic injury, and basically it became ingrained in the pathology literature that eosinophils were a marker of GERD from that time on. But then that began to be uh, 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 an aspect of skepticism, when uh, Steve Atwood, when he and Tom DeMesa were together at Creighton, began to describe this group of patients that they saw from 1986 to 1990 that had uh, eosinophils in their esophagus, they were prim primarily white men, all had dysphagia. To this day, I'm interested in their endoscopic findings because they were reportedly normal. They had uh, hypersensitivity problems and occasionally peripheral eosinophilia but when they did their pH testing, they did not have acid reflux disease. So now we have the dichotomy and the confusion. And it really was, for an extended period of time, confusion. And I think Ico Hirano did this very nice timeline chart, which really starts 
you know, in 1984 with the dogma that eosinophils were part of GERD, and then it began to fall apart as people were beginning to recognize this EOE syndrome, the pediatric gastroenterologists were way ahead of us. They were always thinking this was something different, but we were always saying this was GERD because we were primarily looking for Barrett's esophagus until 2006 when we had the international conference in Orlando and got everybody together. And this is actually a, an article we wrote from our experience at the University of South Florida. Not my experience, but my uh, predecessor, Worth Boyce, was probably one of the earlier people in the United States to identify eosinophilic esophagitis. He said that these people had congenital esophageal stenosis. He took biopsies, sent them to the pathologist, and is shown there. The pathologist read these as either reflux or reflux with eosinophils. And he did it year after year after year. Dr. Boyce, though, continued to treat them with PPIs and dilate them. They did very well. And then in 2006, it was an epiphany as a result of the uh, national conference. So what's the potential uh, pathophysiology of GERD causing mucosal eosinophilia? Uh, this is actually a, a very nice article Stu contributed to the American Journal of Gastroenterology when I was an editor because it was basically a, a kind of just a thought-provoking uh, uh, editorial. And he thought it was too simplistic to talk about these as two di distinct disorders that were separate all the time and that each one may be contributing. GERD could cause esophageal uh, injury with eosinophilia. GERD and EOE could coexist, particularly since 20 to 40 percent of the population will have GERD. Uh, EOE could cause or contribute to GERD. Maybe the cytokines could affect motility and uh, LES function, and GERD could uh, cause or contribute to e, uh, EOE. And again, this comment that in 2007 we had to rule out the GERD part before we could move on with this disease. Well, how could they be linked? They could be linked through these dilated intercellular spaces. Uh, the squamous mucosa has spaces in between, and when inflammation occurs, and it was first described in the acid error, thinking that the acid got down in, in the submucosa through these dilated intercellular spaces, that could trigger heartburn, and we now know that a lot of things are associated with these dilated intercellular spaces, as shown here on this histology slide. And in fact, you don't need EM to see these. You can see them very easy on histology. And then we also know uh, in, the, uh, uh, in treating this that you treat these uh, findings, at least in the GERD error, with uh, PPIs, those dilated intercellular spaces disappear. So again, that possibility that PPI therapies will cause the dilated intercellular spaces to resolve to normal, and then the antigens aren't going to be able to get through that area. And then they begin all these reports about, well, when you see eosinophils, how often is this related to GERD? This is another study, I think, from Tom Demeester's group. When they were at USC, 40 patients, uh, 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 and only 1% of a large population did they have that had um, a lot of mucosal eosinophilia. All had ex extensive esophageal pH testing. And as you can see, the vast majority of these individuals had GERD but some had idiopathic EOE, some overlapped, and some had other diseases. And a hard thing to assess is what's the real prevalence of GERD and mucosal eosinophilia? Uh, whatever it is, it's relatively low. I reviewed a number of articles. I think the best article is probably the one that David Katzka did from the Mayo Experience, looking at patients with Barrett's esophagus and found out that about 7% of their patients with Barrett's esophagus had mucosal eosinophilia, and it's no doubt those patients had GERD. So, well, you're seeing the patient, you take the biopsies, can the pathologist help you distinguish GERD from EOE based on the biopsies? And Rob Otts believes that you probably can, depending on if you're looking carefully, but on the other hand, there's nothing pathognomonic for GERD versus EOE. And he talks about the number of eosinophils, the proximal involvement, the superficial location of the eosinophils, the presence of microabscesses, and particularly the subepithelial fibrosis. Uh, here's another article from New Zealand that emphasizes the proximal extension, and that particularly if the proximal esophagus on the biopsies has eosinophils, it's more likely GERD. On the other hand, if it's just distal, and in our experience, we have about 20 of these patients, the ones that just have distal eosinophilia look like half of them were idiopathic, 
and the other half were actually GERD. And most interestingly is this, this subepithelial fibrosis that's oftentimes read on your biopsies. That's very characteristic of uh, EOE and not of GERD. And this is a nice uh, schematic kind of separating the two, showing a lot of the things that are referred to. Uh, on the left-hand side with the eosinophilic esophagitis, you see the eosinophils are throughout the esophagus, but particularly on the superficial layer. There's a lot higher congregation. They lump together to cause the microabscesses. But again, this subepithelial fibrosis that you do not see with GERD, whereas on the other hand, the GERD eosinophils are less prominent and are more so down by the basal uh, membrane. And again, another uh, slide very nicely showing the uh, uh, accumulation of the eosinophils on the superficial uh, epithelial layer. And so for all this time, we've been saying that GERD and these airborne or oral allergens have been combining together to cause an eosinophilic inflammation, which in certain patients go on to cause fibrosis, probably in most of them, depending on the length of the disease, and some going on to get rings and diffuse scarring. So the confusion about the PPIs, and, and as myself as an esophagologist that was involved in some of the early studies with uh, uh, omeprazole in the 1970s and the 1980s, this is probably the most interesting uh, aspect of this entire disease. Here again, uh, as editor of the American Journal of Gastroenterology, I had the pleasure of kind of publishing this article, and we published this article because it was twixing everything that the EOE mafia was saying about this being an allergic disease. So again, Children's Hospital in Boston, three patients looked like they had ES uh, eosinophilic esophagitis, they had allergies, but they were treated with PPIs, and it went away. And then unfortunately, right after we had the most recent consensus paper, we had this wonderful publication uh, uh, from uh, Molina Infante and colleagues from Spain in which they identified 35 patients with EOE, and they had the demographics that everybody's familiar with. They treated them all with two months BID PPIs, and 75% of the patients got better. 75% got better. The ones that had the GERD profile with the high hernias and the esophagitis, they all got better. But the interesting thing was half of the ones that looked like it was idiopathic EOE, they also got better. And that's when it really began to say all of this was breaking down and pH monitoring wasn't really helping us. And this is one of the nice slides in this uh, scenario. And all of us began to say to ourselves, well, we can't differentiate these patients with suspected EOE that respond to PPIs or don't. They don't look like they're any different. They don't act like they're any different. And in fact, when they look at the genotypes and the other things, they were no different. Well, what about the PPIs? Why are they so effective? Well, they're effective because they do more than control acid. And I think some of the nice work from Ron D'Souza and Stu Speckler's group emphasizes their anti-inflammatory properties, that they down-modulate IL-4 and IL-13 and eotaxin, and is shown in this old cartoon about the pathophysiology of the inflammatory form of EOE, as you can see, when the mast cells are stimulated in the animal model or when the T cells are stimulated, these are the cytokines involved in moving the eosinophils from the bone marrow to the blood and then with eotaxin-3 to the uh, esophageal mucosa. So it totally makes sense why the PPIs are so uh, positive. And this was the confusion because uh, before last year, when we saw these patients, everybody had to have a PPI trial. And if they were responded, they were given this uh, name, PPI responsive uh, eosinophilia. And if they looked more like GERD, we told them they were GERD, and if not, it was idiopathic. And what did it all mean? And it was a big deal, because a lot of these patients were responding to PPIs, but they all looked the same when we were clinically evaluating them. And it really took the Spanish group, the European group, to put this together, and in the last year, also a paper from the U.S. group uh, confirms that basically there's no difference in the two diseases. The phenotype clinical endoscopy histology is identical. The molecular profile is identical. PPIs downregulate TH2 problems, just exactly like topical steroids do. And if you're a PPI responder, 
Some of these patients will also respond to six food elimination diet and or uh, steroids. So no longer do you separate. And in fact, this makes it so much easier, so much easier with our patients because now we see them today, we do the endoscopy, we get the biopsies, distal and proximal. Uh, we make sure there's nothing other obvious thing going on like they haven't been traveling to Africa and may have a parasite or some other allergic disease. And then we can talk to them about medical therapies, we can talk to them about dietary therapies, and we can do esophageal dilatation if they have fibrosinosis as part of their syndrome. So let me give you an example case, because like I said, I don't think it needs to be that hard. Uh, I don't find it a large clinical problem at, at all. Here's a 31-year-old white male, uh, overweight, dysphagia. He had intermittent dysphagia, but no history of food impaction. But heartburn was the driving problem. He had, no, uh, he had some allergies. Endoscopy showed a five centimeter hiatal hernia, LAC esophagitis. Most of the time, we wouldn't have even biopsy these patients in the old days. But he was biopsied, and you can see three eosinophils proximal, 25 distal, placed on esomeprazole, esophagitis healed, eosinophils went away. That's when I got involved with in the case because now what do you do? Is this eosinophilic esophagitis or not? And it was very clear. And we did uh, uh, esophageal manometry and uh, pH testing, obviously a large amount of acid reflux, good symptom correlation. He had anti-reflux surgery and he's two years out doing uh, very well. This is kind of a Kind of a chart that uh, Aiku Urano put together in an article he wrote several years ago, again, distinguishing GERD and uh, eosinophilic esophagitis. And you can see it, it should not be that hard. The GERD patients are primarily dysphagia, uh, or the uh, EOE patients are primarily uh, dysphagia, the GERD patients. They separate out generally very nicely. So in summary, as the clock time is going down, it's uncommon. It should. The GERD patients with eosinophilia look and smell like GERD. Uh, the endoscopy and the histology can help, but if there's ever any question, the pH testing is the way to go. And you treat these patients as you would anyone with GERD uh, with PPIs or surgery, and they do very well. Thank you very much.